Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Before we start our episode, I just want to ask you to help us in our goal to reach 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2022 by clicking subscribe if you haven't already. Today's episode takes us to West Yellowstone, Montana, and specifically to the headwaters of the Madison River, which eventually leads to the Mississippi River. The mountains of western Montana are topped with rocky peaks standing over valleys crowded with pine and fir forests. The ground hides beneath berry bushes of all sorts and seasonal flower arrays. Not only in Yellowstone Park, but in its outlying area, wildlife abound and overflow from the protections of the park. Here, moose, deer, elk, wolves, cougars, and black and brown bears thrive. The industry of this area is obviously tourism, and specifically backcountry tourism, with photo excursions allowing visitors to take their wondrous sights home with them. It is in this setting that today's episode takes place. On April 15th, 2021, Charles Carl Mock was doing what he loved, where he loved to do it. Mock was drawn to Yellowstone National Park from early childhood. He was fascinated with the rugged remoteness of the park, and when he was 30, he moved there just to be closer to the area that he loved. He moved from Pocatello, Idaho, to the village of 900 people, West Yellowstone, in western Montana, just beyond the park boundary. When he was about 30 years old, he got a job at Backcountry Adventure as a snowmobile tour guide in the backcountry of the park. Today, Carl was headed to his favorite trout fishing area on the Madison River, only about 22 miles from the park boundary. He was knowingly participating in a wild and dangerous environment and fully accepted the risks and cherished the rewards. Anywhere around Yellowstone Park, the presence of grizzly bears is a persistent reality that dwells in the mind of sportsmen, from fishermen, hunters, hikers, campers, and even to area workers. Carl knew this and typically packed a sidearm and bear spray with him, though today's trip he was only armed with bear spray. As Charles emerged from his truck, he focused on gathering his fishing pole, camera, and supplies. As he was packing, the peace that he always felt here enveloped him. He picked up his tackle box, pole, and other important items and began to hike down the trail. He was only about a half a mile from the stretch of the river that he wanted to fish after exiting his vehicle. As he walked along the trail, he kept a wary eye out for any number of dangerous animals, as the park was only a few miles to the east. Bison, grizzly bears, and moose have been involved in attacks in the prior years, and Carl didn't want to have any problems. Through the years, he had faced down several bears. Carl and his friend Riley had run-ins with bears and even had bluff charges meant to intimidate them. But they were always just bluffs, and the men simply went about their business afterward with nothing serious having ever happened. As Carl walked along the riverbank, snapping photos of the beautiful scenery and looking for a good spot to dip his line, he unknowingly walked into one of the most dangerous situations he could have found. In the prior days, a large boar grizzly bear had either found or killed a moose that it was now claiming as its prize. The bear defended this food source to the point of killing and partially eating another grizzly, and was still enraged and irritated from the event. Given that Carl was by himself, he only had one set of eyes and ears watching out for danger. As he skirted a stand of timber, Carl heard a loud woof. Having recognized it as a bear, he likely stood up and surveyed the area around him for the upset bear. Carl pulled out his bear spray as a precaution and prepared for what is typically a very tense standoff. As he searched the brush for the bear, it came streaking toward him with its head low and ears pinned back in the usual fashion of a bear defending its food cache. Carl hoped that it would just be another bluff charge, but as the bear approached it, it didn't veer off or slow down. He watched as its eyes focused solely on him and its claws dug into the snow churning to propel itself in his direction. The bear closed the last 40 yards of distance with blinding speed and Carl discharged his pepper spray once the bear crossed the effective target distance. The orange cloud billowed from the spray can and it didn't have the desired effect on the bear as it quickly knocked Carl to the ground. Once atop Carl, the bear focused its attack on Carl's head and neck. It used its claws and powerful jaws to inflict utter destruction on tissues and bones. The bear swatted at Carl's head and its sharp claws and overwhelming power removed significant portions of his scalp. What the claws did not remove from his scalp, the bear's jaws completed. 
The bear bit into Carl's scalp and removed huge chunks of flesh and tattered what wasn't removed. It then bit into his neck, tearing flesh and crucial arteries and veins as it vented its anger at the offense of his trespass. Carl lifted his hand to protect his head and neck, but the bear simply crushed it into useless, disorganized lumps of bleeding flesh. It took his head in its mouth and tried to crush his skull, but was only successful in punching one of its canine teeth through it. With a quarter-sized hole through Carl's skull, his hand made useless, and most of his scalp torn and mutilated, the bear finally stopped the attack and went back to its food cache, just a few hundred feet away. As Carl's blood painted the ground in a macabre version of Mother Nature's artwork, he gained consciousness and determined to get into an area to reach out for help. He tried crawling, but was in no shape to move. Carl managed to prop himself up in an upright position against a tree trunk. He slowly searched his supplies with his only useful hand to find his cell phone and could only hope for reception, as this may be his only means of getting help. He dialed 911 and his call was picked up. Emergency responders were immediately dispatched. Carl remained on the phone with them for nearly an hour, relaying important details of the attack as they worked their way toward him, directed by Carl. When they found him, he was still clutching his bear spray can in his functional hand. He was stabilized as best they could at the scene and immediately transported to the Eastern Idaho Emergency Medical Center in Idaho Falls, Idaho, for life-saving medical support. The next day, as Carl and the medical team fought for his life, Montana game wardens approached the area. They made a lot of noise and were very clear in their efforts to run the bear off so they could complete their investigation into the attack. The bear had other plans, though, and as they approached it, it emerged from cover in the same threatening manner as it addressed Carl, head low and ears pinned back in clear signs of aggression. The wardens fired off special rounds at crackle and pop in an attempt to persuade the bear to back off. As the bear powered toward the seven volunteers and their dog, it got bogged down in some deep snow, temporarily slowing its attack. The bear quickly regained its traction and continued its advance toward the group. The bear closed to within 20 yards of the men before they employed lethal rounds and dropped the bear. As its blood seeped into the soil, its rage and aggression seemed to dissipate as it stopped all of its movement. The wardens performed a necropsy on the bear's carcass and investigated the attack scene. On Carl's clothes, they had previously noted the contents of his bear spray can. As they examined the bear, the same was found on the bear's fur, meaning that Carl had in fact discharged his bear spray in a proficient manner. Once the bear had been cut open and the contents of its gut analyzed, the wardens determined that the bear had been feeding on the moose it was defending and found tissues from at least one of the grizzly bear. Back at the medical center, Carl had two surgical procedures in an attempt to save his life. According to doctors, the surgeries went well, but within a few days, Carl suffered a severe stroke and died from the trauma inflicted during the bear attack. West Yellowstone organized a memorial service at the Union Pacific Dining Lodge in town and his family held their own private ceremony in commemoration of Carl. Two nights after Carl was mauled, the town of West Yellowstone had a bear visit them. The locals point out that the bears are so numerous that they can hardly avoid run-ins with them. The greater Yellowstone area, which spans portions of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, is reported to have more than 700 grizzly bears. Fatal attacks have increased in recent decades as the bears recover from threatened status, as well as humans have moved into more rural areas than ever. Since 2010, grizzlies have killed eight people in the greater Yellowstone area. Grizzlies are still under federal protection in areas outside of Alaska, although recent discussions have begged review of that status. After understanding the facts surrounding this attack, I'm left wondering, do you think it's worth the risk to venture into areas where bears are? Do you think bear populations are too high near cities and need to be reduced through hunting? Do you prefer hazing bears away from areas where people are instead of hunting? Should bears that have attacked and possibly eaten people be allowed to go free, or is there a useful aspect to the removal of such animals from the populations? Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If your comment is the most liked comment in 7 days from the posting of this video, you will receive a $50 credit to use at our merch store. We want to make sure to thank our patrons who have committed to supporting us with a monthly contribution. Thank you Dina White, Cole Rodriguez, Aurora, April Donovan, Ryan Cernicky, Char, Chris Marlar, Wayne Washington, Fluffy Feet, Cheyenne, Greg Schaefer, and Drone Adventures. Your support means the world to me. Our merch store is being revamped due to fulfillment problems, and we're getting online with a new fulfillment company, so I'll keep you posted on it as we get it up and running again. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider showing us by liking and subscribing to our channel. 
Clicking on the bell icon will let you know when we release new episodes and sharing our videos on your social media platforms spreads awareness. As a valued member of our human community, I hope you will adventure bravely and remember to be safe out there, especially in bear country.